Very pleased to welcome back to the show. I've got Joseph Schachter here, uh, and we can find Joseph, by the way, Schachter Energy Report at www.schachterenergyreport.ca, schachterenergyreport.ca. Joseph, great to have you back with us. My pleasure, Michael. I mean, no shortage of things to talk about as usual, and the reason is this. It's straightforward. I mean, you look at the impact on the oil-related industry, the energy industry, on the overall Canadian economy. So we've seen a pickup, for example, uh, you know, in some sort of capital investment. It looks like the bottom is in. We've seen a little bit of a rise in the capital investment, not where we were pre-drop levels, but presto, then you get a much better GDP number as we got in the first quarter. Yeah, that, again, the price of oil is about the same as it was a year ago, so, um, you know, that 50. And the rig count has gone up uh, in the oil area quite a bit. If you look at the U.S., the uh, rig count last week is up for the 20th week, up 11 uh, rigs to 733. But that's up uh, from 325. That's 126% above a year ago. In Canada, the rig count is now 99. It was up 6 last week, and that's up from 41 a year ago, 141%. And yet the, cons- and the commodity is the same price. So we're beginning to see, you know, um, uh, uh, quite a bit of a response uh, because the cost structure has come down so much. And the uh, companies now, um, many of them have, uh, you know, potentially under $20 input costs uh, removing land. So let's say just the drilling and, and completion and hooking it up. And so with the price of oil where it is right now, there's, it's very economic. And that's why we're seeing the U.S. Uh, production up so sharply. Um, if you take into account domestic U.S. production, the EIA report that came out on Thursday, Thursday because of the holiday on Monday, um, the U.S. oil production is up 607,000 uh, bar- barrels from a year ago to 9.3, and other supply, which includes liquids, is up another 492. So the U.S. production alone is up 1.1 million barrels from a year ago, and um, that effectively is the same as the OPEC cut, and that's the problem. I, you know, sorry, I want to come back to something you said there because I, I happen to be listening to an interview earlier this week and it was somebody who is, let's say, not a fan of the oil industry, and they're saying that's because we have to transition away from technology, and I almost, I'm sorry, away from resources into technology, and I almost choked thinking, do you not understand the degree to which, uh, you know, oil, for example, but there's other resource examples, are technology-based businesses now? Oh, yeah, like, the, you know, the cost structure and then, and then you know, horizontal drilling, fracking, uh, you know, they used to go maybe a mile in terms of the horizontal. Now they can go three miles in terms of the length of the horizontal. The productivity per well is, is there uh, much higher than it was years ago. And, you know, you can see that from just the Permian Basin. We can see it in the Montney in Canada, the Cardium. Um, the productivity by companies is, is, in, is significantly above what it is um, years ago. And again, uh, that's uh, that's the reason why uh, Canadian production is is heading towards record levels this year. The United States probably will get to about 10 million barrels a day, assuming prices stay where they are by the end of the year. The um, productivity report that comes out from the EIA is showing that uh, uh, the U.S. production is growing by 120,000 barrels a day uh, per month. Um, and so by the end of the year, 10 million will be a, you know a, a conservative number. Canada is going to add 200,000 barrels a day, and that's mainly the Fort Hills project coming on by Suncor, and Brazil has offshore. So whatever OPEC's done um, is not really um, you know, going to make a change, and, and that's why I think we've seen the price of oil back off. And I'm still in the bear camp. I think that the price of oil is going to break $40 during the month of June, and then I think we set up um, uh, the final shellacking, which is usually three or four months. If you go back to 2009, you go back to late 2015, 2016, once you break $40 or whatever the resist, you know, the support level has been, then the final shakeout comes, and that's when you finally, and that's when the bargains show up. So we've been saying to people, um, hold off from investing. We've come up with 10 names on our coverage list uh, on the Schachter Energy Report. We're going to have three or four more names each month for the uh, for our subscribers. And um, the largest company we cover right now is uh, 1.5 billion. The smallest company we cover is about uh, 14 million market cap, and we're covering both energy. And and energy service, and we're going to add three or four more names so that by the time we get into the, the low, which I think might happen in October, November, we will have 20-plus names uh, for people to look at. 
uh, with different risk profiles, with different uh, market areas that they're involved in, both Canadian, uh, U.S., international, uh, service sector, large cap, small cap, different types of parts of the service sector. And so every month we're adding more and more names, and that's why we started the product in April, um, because we knew that we were going to have one more down phase, but we want to get comfort, people comfortable with the types of ideas that are out there, and then they can decide what fits uh, their portfolios. There's two things that jump out at me here, Joseph. That uh, One is that if the ability to produce uh, so quickly and to ramp up production is quick, does that put a ceiling on, on future gains? I mean, we pop above 50 maybe, you know, $60, but because people will just, you know, they're able to produce so much less expensively, bring on the product so quickly that it becomes profitable at a much lower number, and presto, they feed into that any price rise. Yeah, that, you know, that's a, that's more of a short-term issue. The big thing to remember is that outside of OPEC, the proven RLI of, of companies has shrunk significantly. In the 1970 cycle, you had 14 to 16 years. Um, and then in the 2000 to 2008 uh, cycle, we had like seven to nine years proven reserves. Today, we have five or six year proven RLI. So the treadmill to replace the declines is really a lot tougher. And on proved producing reserves, in many cases, we're under four years. So it means you've got to replace a quarter of your production every year just to stand still. And that's where you set up the new bull cycle. Now, will we go to $100 oil um, in you know the next two or three years? I don't know. But if we get to 70 or $80, in the next uh, two or three years from a low, let's say, of 30 uh, to 34 sometime in the, in the latter part of this year, that will be uh, the big rec- recovery. And, of course, if the cost structure stays reasonable, then the companies will do very, very well. My, the, the, the Canadian TSCX Energy Index, um, as you remember, when we were at the World Outlook, we were negative. Um, the, the index has come down uh, about 12%. The oil price has come down 10% from, from the conference. But if you take it from the high of December, the TSX oil and gas index is down 22%, and stocks like Imperial Oil are now at 52-week lows. Uh, let me come back to also, uh, is there a number, I mean, it's a broad number, I know, but is there a number we can put on, uh, for for example, if you're talking about Alberta oil into the oil sands, uh, the cost of extraction, you know, compared to, say, 10 years ago or something like that? Oh, yeah, if you go, like, you know, just take into account the problems with Syncrude. Syncrude at one point had $60 uh, break-even costs, and now under Suncor and, and the aggressive, uh, you know, changes that they've made, the break-even is in the low 30s. And for, uh, you know, for Suncor's other assets, uh, that they, the, the legacy assets, it's in the low 20s. So they've really done a, an aggressive job of finding ways to be more productive and cut the costs and, and of course, be more environmentally sensitive in terms of use of water. Um, and so all of the, the industry right across the board from conventional to thermal to, uh, you know, to the large uh, oil sands projects, everywhere across the industry, we've seen significant uh, improvement. And now we're beginning to see reports coming that the offshore side has come down and that they're able to be functional at 40 and $50 a barrel. The key thing, though, is, is that the production, uh, because of the reserve life is so short, we have to spend so much money to replace the declines, and, and the whole structure of the cost side has come down. But, the, but over time, um, it, the basins are, it's harder and harder to find new oil. You know, there's no talk anymore of new oil sands projects, like, you know, with the 8 or $10 billion, you know, big, big projects anymore. Uh, there's talk still of maybe doing thermal. But with all of the problems that you have now, um, you know, provincially with, uh, tr- with takeaway capacity, especially, you know, with the new changes in your own government in B.C., uh, and the issue of Kinder Morgan and building that, you know, the Trans Mountain expansion, um, you know, the, 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 you know, will companies spend the money if they don't have takeaway capacity? And that's going to be one of the big battles for Canada. And that's why uh, when in your conversation earlier, you know, over the U- Canadian dollar issue, I think if we see sub forty dollars U.S., we're going to see that low price of the Canadian dollar that we're talking about, and we will bust seventy cent Canadian, maybe down even to you know sixty seven or sixty eight cents compared to the U.S. dollar. Yeah, and and that's exactly the scenario I'm seeing playing out also there. And as you say, there's a lot of uncertainty in the industry at this point. Uh, I got to take a break. I'll come back. Many more questions for Joseph Schachter, uh, but I want to tell you about this. Uh, Joseph may not even know this, but we've talked to his office, and we have a, an exclusive offer for uh, Money Talks listeners here. Uh, as you know, the Schachter Energy Report 
I think it's a very important kind of time period for this, as Joseph has just elaborated on. But this is only for this weekend. Uh, so you've got to go to the moneytalks.net website there. Uh, by the way, the full-year subscription at $499 uh, is, is a great buy, period, because if there's an opportunity, I don't mind people like Joseph Schachter picking the stocks for me there. But for right now, you can get a two-month trial subscription here for $17. You heard that right. Two-month trial subscription for $17. Dollars. So go to moneytalks.net. We put it right in the front page there. Uh, as I say, this is a very interesting part, a fascinating part of the market there. Uh, Joseph's track record has been exceptional, and we've benefited from that on Money Talks, of course, uh, exceptional. So just go to uh, moneytalks.net right there. We're talking about the Schachter Energy Report. I'll take a break. I'll come back. Many more questions about that sector because the impact, of course, on the overall economy. First thing I want to know is have we indeed seen a pickup in capital investment when it comes to the oil companies? Does Joseph think that will slow down now with the uncertainty uh, over the Trans Mountain Pipeline? Of course, uh, Premier Rachel Notley and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau say there's no uncertainty. It's getting built. I'll get Joseph's take on that when we come back right here on the Money Talks Network. Goodness, I remember when this album came out, Sgt. Pepper's, and people say, when I'm 64, and, you know, it's the summer of love, 1967, and every young person sort of thought, 64, that sounds like a million years away, and here we all are, not all of us, but those who celebrated the 1967 release of Sgt. Pepper's, I bet most of those people are 60 to 70 years old at this point, or more on that, so uh, we're celebrating it because it's the 50th anniversary. Hey, let me do this. I want to give a shout-out to Chris Ake Ackerman and Amin Suleiman. Uh, Amin Suleiman from the Radisson Hotel in Red Deer, Chris Ackerman from Metallic Minerals. Both of them uh, stepped up to the plate. I was talking last week, and we still need the help. Uh, Special Olympics auction items or sponsorships. You know, it's $1,000 to sponsor a hole. It's the tournament that uh, I help organize there for Special Olympics. I'll be there emceeing. That sounds like a nightmare and a threat, but I'll be there, of course. And we have so many people who help out with this, and we have these whole sponsorships or on-course things like Long Drive, etc., between $1,000 and $1,500 if you can help us out. And if you've got a good auction item, as uh, uh, Amin let us in on for the Radisson Red Deer and Radisson Hotel chain, uh, if you've got auction items that you think uh, would be of interest to people, yeah, we can use the help. Info at moneytalks.net. As I say, thanks to Chris Ackerman. Thanks to Amin Suleiman. Right now, though, we've got Joseph Schachter on the line. Joseph, uh, so much to talk about. SchachterEnergyReport.ca. Schachter is spelled S-C-H-A-C-H-T-E-R, EnergyReport.ca. And I'm going to tell you about that uh, special offer, and again, in just a moment's time. But, Jeff, Joseph, let me just come to this. Have we seen enough pickup in capital investment in the oil sector, especially in Alberta, to let you say, okay, the bottom's in, here we go? Not Absolutely not. Um, the industry is not replacing its decline rates in many cases. Uh, most companies, uh, you know, a lot of them still have a lot of debt. So the cash flow that's coming in, uh, of course, has to service the overhead and then the debt. And so companies in many cases are having declines in production uh, year over year. And um, that's the same thing in the United States, except for the hot basins like the Permium, the Eagleford, and now the Bakken will start turning up. Uh, in Canada, you'll, you'll see positive numbers in the Montney um, and a few other areas, but the majority of the basin um, is still going to be showing declines. The big increase that, that's going to take Canadian production up this year uh, from 4.5 to 4.7, 4.8 um, is the Horizon Project, sorry, is the Fort Hills Project uh, by Suncor. So it's really one big project um, on the oil sand side that's going to make the big difference. And you mentioned this earlier, but all the foo because of uh, the Green Party NDP in British Columbia saying they'll do everything they can to prevent it, although it is fre- federal jurisdiction, but they certainly can delay it, and they said they're going to and want to introduce a court challenge as soon as possible. Uh, how much impact will that have on producers' plans to uh, you know, spend some money? That's going to be a big issue. Uh, you know, a lot of companies have, have booked uh, firm transportation on that. Uh, they want to get the uh, the oil to the coast. Look, you know, we, we, there's no issue for shipping in in Burnaby if it's uh, if we're moving coal or if we're moving lumber or if we're moving grain. And those are single hull tankers. Uh, the most shipping for all you know for North America, all shipping in North America has to go in double hulled tankers. So the security of the of, of leaks or any problems is 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 the toughest 
safer oil movement uh, and, and product than any other industry out there. Second, we're not going through new land. This is a, they're going through a corridor that's already in existence. Yes, there's going to be some more expansion of the, of the terminal system at the end of it because of the more throughput. But the reality is you're using um, you know, facilities that are already in place and just expanding them. So uh, I, I think logically it should go ahead, but can the environmental issues, uh, native land claims issues, First Nations issues be, be, be an ability to delay it? The company wants to, um, uh, Kinder Morgan wants to start construction in, in the fall, September. Um, that issue, of course, uh, is, is, is an issue in the political football area now. And will the courts in B.C. Um, put in any limitations so that they, they can't go ahead? Or do, does this thing move quickly into the federal court system and the federal courts uh, trump it and say, um, you do have the right to go ahead? And then the question is, is, you know, will people stand in the way, uh, you know, and stop uh, the trucks moving and, and that? So there's a lot of um, issues here that uh, c- could make this a, a very tough uh, situation for a while. You know, it's interesting, uh, you know, talking about some new uh, production possibly or reserves found offshore in Newfoundland. I think we're the only country in the world that doesn't celebrate uh, this resource. And even when I get here, things like uh, Norway, you know, I get that p- uh, put up as, look what Norway can do with high taxes and this and that. And I say, well, my gosh, you're talking about one of the major oil exporters in the world through pipelines offshore. <laughs> you know? Yeah, oil and natural gas. They're a yes, big producer of, course, of both. Yeah. And, and they have this massive financial reserve because they didn't spend all the money. And, you know, while the, you know, Alberta has the Heritage Fund, it was never made uh, as big as, uh, you know, that or some of the ones in the Middle East where they took off the gravy in the, in the very buoyant price years and put it into the reserve fund so that they would, you know, because they know they have a depleting mm-hmm. asset, and having those those uh, financial reserves um, can can offset uh, you know, the costs of government, and therefore tax rates can stay lower. It's a fascinating time, as you say, but I think more, more for our audience right now, it's very important to get uh, the sort of timeline that Joseph's got. So, Joseph, uh, in 30 seconds, you're looking for one more decline into this uh, period, you know, coming in in the next five six months, and that will create the buying opportunity. Right, because, you know, the the last hurrah, if if we go down and break 40 and go down to the low 30s or maybe lower, uh, what we're telling our clients is we have what we call um, a coverage list, and then we say we're going to send out action alerts when we think that there's a that there's an attractive buying opportunity. We have not sent out any action alerts yet, and what we're saying to people is we have two two price points: an attractive price point and a table pounding price point. The stocks have gone down in a number of cases below that lower level of the table pounding, but the last decline can be very nasty. For example, our largest cap company that we have in the period of the last three four months of the shape out in 2009, uh, 2006, 15, 16, went from $7 to $2.84. But then from that bottom and that window when, when there was total fear and that S&P uh, percentage bullish index that I show at the World Outlook Financial Conference got down to 2%, um, that stock went from 284 to $10 in six months. So there's tremendous b- opportunities here for, for investors to buy companies that, are, that have balance sheets that are, are secure, that, are, that have done this research structurings and cost cutting to, to survive in this area. There, but there are some companies out there, and that's where the danger is, and people should do their homework, is where they still have significant balance sheet problems, lots of debt, and those companies, some of them may not, uh, may not survive be, uh, at the end of this year. And that's we've, got leave it at, we've got to leave it at that, Joseph, and I'm going to come back. I'll talk about this offer, because I'll tell you how to do research. Go to moneytalks.net, click on the Schachter button. I'll give you more on that. Got to take a break. My thanks to Joseph Schachter. Back with a shocking stat. 